uh, glad to be here, and um, it has been a busy eight days. Um, this is my 11th time speaking since last Sunday. Two funeral services, three times last Sunday for the regular, three times today the regular, Tuesday night, Bible study, Wednesday night, Bible study, Thursday night, extension class next door. So uh, when I start talking about uh, Ephesian Gen Iticus and Moses and his Ark of Many Colors, then you'll understand why. I'm just a little confused. Uh, if, you, if you've ever spoken on a regular basis, I, I had somebody, I said, how do you keep all that straight? I don't know. I guess that's God that does, <laughs> you know, he keeps it straight for the sake of his children because um, I'm not really sure sometimes if I'm coming or going. Tonight we're going to talk about a lot of people's favorite book in the New Testament, Philippians. It is a very encouraging book. And uh, last Sunday morning, we actually had a lesson from Philippians chapter 2 related to our study through our devotionals uh, from last fall. And we talked about unity. We're not going to rehash that lesson tonight. Um, but the there's so many lessons in the book of Philippians. It's a short book. It's an easy read. Ten minutes and you're done. But you can spend a lifetime studying it and not glean all of the, the beauty from this precious uh, letter between the Apostle Paul and a group of Christians he would die for. I mean, he loved them so dearly. Would you pray with me as we begin? Thank you so much, Father, for granting us time and opportunity to be here tonight. And thank you for the preciousness of this opportunity on the Lord's Day to to look into your word and to enjoy the company of one another as we worship together. Father, we ask you to be with us as we look into this lovely book of Philippians. Help us to learn and to grow, Father, and to be changed, to be more like your son. It's through Jesus that we pray. Amen. Well, the author, of course, is the Apostle Paul. And this letter was likely written during the same time period as the Ephesian letter. Um, we, we don't know exactly um, date, month, what have you. But we do know that this is one of his prison epistles. And he is in his chains as he writes. And as he writes from deplorable conditions I can feel very certain he writes a letter of encouragement and love and joy and it shows us that despite the circumstances we find ourselves in life we can always rejoice in the Lord it's a beautiful beautiful book uh, the purpose and I'm not really sure what fought uh, is there that should be for thee um the, um, the slides I use for this series that I'm doing uh, are not originally in English. And sometimes it'll, it'll change the words on me. And I don't know if I mistyped that because it didn't underline it. So fata means something in some language besides English. I'm not sure what it is. But usually all of the English words that are spelled correctly, it underlines them in red. So who knows? But anyway, he's expressing his uh, affection for these believers. He truly, truly uh, was in love with these individuals. He was thanking them for their gift. They had come up with a monetary gift that they really couldn't afford to help the, the saints in uh, Judea. And he was trying to encourage them to continue in a life of unity and holiness and joy. Very humble beginnings for the church in Philippi. Chapter 16, 9 through 40, began with a, a small group of women he preaches to, and one in particular, Lydia, and her household obeyed the gospel. We had a jailer, not too long thereafter, who was uh, a Roman soldier, and he 
and his family obeyed the gospel. And so they probably made up the core group of this congregation. They were certainly the, um, as some Americans are wont to claim, charter members of the Philippian church. Um, It is to this group of people that he writes. The key word here is joy, and I don't think there's any... um, any question about that key verse chapter 4 and verse 4 rejoice in the Lord always and again I will say rejoice I know we have set that verse to song and it is probably one of the earliest memory verses that many of our children learn or we as adults learn when we come to faith Uh, It is one that will serve you quite well, regardless of where you find yourself. There's always something to rejoice in. And so as we have uh, continued through this series, we want to have a lesson uh, from this book. And so I'd invite you to join me in Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. 3 through 6. For we are the circumcision who worship God in spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh, though I also might have confidence in the flesh. If anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I'm more so. Though, excuse me, sir, uh, though I'm more so circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, concerning the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning righteousness, which is in the law, blameless. So he's presenting his pedigree in Judaism. Now, during this particular time, we know that there were troublemakers who were out there that were uh, Judaizing. They were trying to convert Christian uh, former pagans, Gentiles, to the law of Moses so they could be full-fledged, accepted into the Christian faith. Well, there could never be a more uh, pedigreed Jew than was Paul. And that's why he's presenting his pedigree here. He is showing that I am a Jew of Jews, and anybody that claims they are Jew, I am more Jew than they are. Because when it comes to Judaism, I persecuted the church. I was a Pharisee. And he just went right down the line. And he talks about we are the circumcision who worship God in spirit, rejoice in Christ, and have no confidence in the flesh. The circumcision physically were the Jews. The circumcision, who are truly the circumcision in the spirit, rejoicing in Christ, having no confidence in the flesh, are those who have been baptized in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit for the remission of their sins. And through the work of God, they have received the circumcision of the heart. 7 through 11. But what things were gained to me so he's bragging on his past. And, of course, we understand he's not necessarily bragging. He's just presenting himself to a certain level so that the others can see exactly what is important. But what things were gained to me, these I have counted for loss. Yet, indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and counted them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering, being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. May God bless the reading of his word. This word know that is found here refers to an intimate trusting relationship. 
I went to, Susie and I went to the same high school, though not at the same time. Um, and I didn't grow up in that town. I w lived there for 10th, 11th, and 12th grade. So I had no background with any of those people during the time I was there. And I made some friends, mostly just acquaintances, but I did make some friends there. And I, I maintained social media contact with a handful of them now. But I graduated with 303 people in my class. And at the time I graduated, I could probably tell you about everybody's name. Even though I didn't know them, I at least knew them, knew them by name. And I, I could tell you that I knew them even though I didn't have a relationship with them because when I say I, I know them, I mean that I am familiar with them. We have a, a strange turn of a phrase in English called I used to know. And I used to know about 303 people that I, gra well, 302 I do know myself, that I graduated with. I know, I know it's me because I'm the one with the cut on the head. Um, I used to know those people. I don't know those people anymore. As a matter of fact, most of them I would not recognize if they walked in the door because I haven't seen them since 1980, May the 30th. It's been a long time since I've seen them. That is not the way that word know is used by Paul. It is not the way the word know is used in the scriptures. It is a relationship. It is intimate. It is trusting. And when he talks about knowing Christ, it's more than just knowing about him. It's more than just having factual information at the ready. You know, there are a lot of atheists that probably know the Bible as well or better than most of us. They know the facts, and they learn the facts so they can you know, contradict and confound the facts. Knowing the facts doesn't make you anything. I used to be, and again, there's that turn of the phrase, um, and probably if I thought hard enough, I could, I could bring up a lot of these things. But, you know, the top batting average, lifetime, Major League Baseball, put your hand up if you know who that is. Just a handful of people. It's Ty Cobb, 367, lifetime. How many of you know who number two is? Rogers Hornsby, 358. Rogers Hornsby is the only guy that ever hit over 400 four times. And he has the highest season batting average at 424. And he played about every position on the field. And say, I used to know all of those statistics, but you know, I never played professional baseball. Never did. I, I know the modern baseball players, I know very little about them because I, it's, I've never really kept up with it. But when I was growing up, and Jimmy Fox, and, uh, you know, I, I can get into some of those names, Mel Ott, some of the, the old timers that you don't ever hear about because they weren't the most famous ones were some of the best baseball players. And I used to know all about them, but I never played professional baseball. And so in the same way, people can know about Christ and they can know about his word, but yet never have any kind of relationship with what they're dealing with. And so knowing Christ is more than just knowing him. It is about a personal, intimate knowledge or relationship with Christ. And that's what Paul's talking about here in chapter 3. In verses 7 through the first part of verse 8, he is saying that there is no honor, achievement, or glory that he would not exchange for this knowledge. There's nothing he wouldn't give up for this knowledge. And I, I don't want to go too deep into it, but um, the New King James says uh, his former things, he counted them as rubbish. The, the Greek word there actually refers to animal excrement. 
That, that's how little he thought of his former life compared to having a relationship with Christ. And you can borrow whatever euphemism you want to borrow, but that's, the, that's what Paul said. And so he's, he's making sure that he's not misunderstood here. I believe in the King James, uh, they use the word dung. Um, they softened it in the, the New King James and, and some of the other versions, but it is, it, it is a very graphic term that he's using here. Because, now, when you compare your old life and, and you think it's that, even though you look at his pedigree and, and he counts it as that compared to this over here, how important is this? It's invaluable. It's absolutely invaluable. And there was nothing he would not exchange in order to have that knowledge of Christ. And so we see that that I may gain Christ, be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes by, from God by faith. The place of redemption that he talks about here is in him. And, and we've been talking about this on our Wednesday night uh, in our adult class. And in him or its corresponding phrase in Christ, in Jesus, in Jesus Christ, in the Lord, etc., etc., etc. 150 times Paul uses that phrase. And if you ever want a fruitful study, pull them all up and find out what it means. Find out what is available to you in him. It, it is fascinating. And then the question becomes, as we brought up uh, Wednesday night before last, I believe, how do I get there? How do I get in him? Because once you realize what the benefits are of being in him, naturally, how do I get there? Is the question that flows. And be found in him. He's talking about at his return. Now, what does that mean? Well, in Revelation 14, 13, and for those who were with us yesterday, uh, you know that I used that uh, verse for our sister Marjorie. You know, it, it's a beautiful thing to me to think about the labor following. Y you all, and I don't know how much of it you think it is, because uh, it may not be worth a whole lot, but you are benefiting from people that have gone to be with the Lord through me because I have mentors who helped me that have gone to be with the Lord. And their labors in me, I'm sharing with you. And those things continue like ripples in a pond as long as we remain faithful. Whether you're teaching children, whether you're preaching in a pulpit, it makes no difference. You're sharing those things with others, sharing them with your neighbors, sharing them with our children, whatever we're doing. And our labors as we rest do follow. But I want you to look at this verse 14, 13. I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Right, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Lord, that they may rest from their labors and their works follow them. Blessed are the dead who die where? In the Lord. In him. In Jesus. In Christ. Blessed are those who die in that condition. And so when Paul says to be found in him when he returns, you see, it's one thing to be in him now, it's another thing to still be in him when he returns or when we die. So that is something we want to secure in our lives and maintain in our lives. 10 and 11. He says, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. You know, we will, that is something that Paul did not know. He was not in a position to know that yet. Now, he had raised the dead, but that's not the resurrection that is the power of Christ's resurrection. 
That's the temporary miraculous resurrection, which served a number of purposes, primarily the confirmation of, of God's word, because those people who were raised died again. Wanted to know the power of the resurrection. You know, when, when you think, and I don't know how many of you have, have actually done any serious thinking on it. It hurts my head. What is that going to be like? Because the descriptions of it are not really descriptions. They're more just saying it's going to happen. I don't know that, the, that language could even describe it, what it would be like. We know that our corruptible is going to put on incorruption, and this mortal is going to put on immortality, and that we, in the twinkling of an eye, are going to be like Christ in his resurrected form. But what does that mean? What does that look like? How, how does that motivate us? And Paul himself, that I may know the power of his resurrection. You know, everyone will know the power of his resurrection, but not in the way that Paul is referring to. Jesus in John chapter 5, uh, there's going to come a time when he's going to call forth and all of the dead will rise up and the wicked will go off to their punishment and the righteous will go off to their reward. So even the, the dead wicked will be raised they'll be resurrected but that's not the resurrection that he wants to know about he wants to know about the one that leads to eternal life that's the one that he wants and he also says that he may have fellowship the fellowship of his sufferings I don't know if I'm there yet When I think about the sufferings of Christ, I don't know that I'm there yet. That I really want to have fellowship. I want to be a sharer or partaker in those sufferings. That, that's a strong statement. And it would be easy to say until you actually had a stronger knowledge of what that's actually talking about. Well, Paul, of all people, suffered greatly. We do not know about the other apostles outside of uh, the uh, extra-biblical writings about the suffering that they went through and some of the things they endured. But we know a lot about Paul. And Paul, from the very moment that he lost his sight, Ananias is being told, he must be told what he's got to suffer for me. The suffering was in place before he ever received his sight back and his name was changed to Paul. Already had that in mind. And Paul embraced that. Being shipwrecked, being beaten, being stoned. Forty lashes minus one. Three times. And you know, when he's listing those things in second corinthians he says that probably the greatest suffering that he endured was his constant care for the churches it was an emotional or psychological burden that he bore that was greater than the physical but knowing christ is such an important part of the christian walk first john chapter 2 beginning in verse 3 now, by this we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He who says, I know him, and does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. He who says he abides in him also ought to walk just as he walked one of the tests of being in him abiding in him knowing him is doing what he said and trying to live like he lived that's a huge test 
And I'm going to tell you, and I, I probably don't even have to tell you this, but you know, we're never going to live fully up to that. We're never going to be able to fully walk just as Christ walked. But that is uh, what we seek to attain. That is our goal. And when you set your goals high, even when you may fall short of that goal, you achieve so much more than, you know, hey, I just, I want to, I want to walk just like Mark walked. Well, that's not very impressive. But when you set your goal as Christ, that's when you, you raise your effort in the kingdom. Jesus prayed the night he was betrayed a beautiful prayer in John chapter 17. And as he enters into this intimate moment with the Father, verse 3 he says, And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, in Christ Jesus, whom you have sent. Eternal life is knowing the Father and the Son. This is a challenging subject in the book of joy. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will tell you. Again, I will say it. Rejoice. And then he drops the gauntlet on knowing Christ. But that's a part of the joy-filled life is knowing Christ. You can't truly have joy if you don't know him. If you're not abiding in him. And if you're not seeking to have fellowship with him in all of his ways. Counting our former life as worthless less than worthless compared to what we once had. I hope you've been encouraged by this lesson. Every time I study chapter 3 of Philippians, I, I'm encouraged. Because knowing Christ is the most important thing that you'll ever do on this earth. This is eternal life, that they may know you in Jesus Christ, whom you've sent. If you have a need tonight, if you have a need for prayer or for encouragement of some kind, or if you're here tonight and you never named the name of Christ and you desire to put on Christ in baptism, we would invite you to come as together we stand and sing.